Good morning, friends. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome to the service of worship with the faith community of University United Methodist Church here in Lake Charles, Louisiana. We are a church that is connecting people to Christ, caring for the broken and for all people, and changing the world around us. And so today, we want to just in, in, invite you in, even more closely in, try to invite you to uh, lay away all distractions. I know over these past few months, it might be difficult to give your full attention uh, to worship, but we ask that you would just give yourself that gift this morning uh, to be poured into in the Spirit of God. And so we welcome all, but especially those that are maybe joining us for the first time. We'd love to know who you are and would invite you to text the number that's below on your screen uh, so that we can find out your name and find out other ways that we can connect you to the vital ministry that uh, we offer to our community here through our congregation. Uh, today, we are at a point of transition, and we celebrate that we are. Man, it has been a long road uh, toward this moment. Uh, but it is the week before we re-enter our facility for worship. June 14th will be our first set of in-person worship services at 8.30 and 11 o'clock. Uh, but today, uh, even though we are still vir virtually worshiping together uh, across the miles, you will experience a, a, a consecration of communion and then have the opportunity to receive that communion in person through our drive-through communion offering. Reverend Chris and I'll be standing right outside of the church here at uh, 3501 Patrick Street at 11 o'clock till about 12.30, and uh, we'll be just ready to receive each of you, give you a communion uh, a, a offering the, in a sanitary way, and pray over whoever is in your car. We just wanna be able to reach out to you and connect with you in safe but in meaningful ways. And so today's gonna be a special day where we'll uh, be able to see and connect with each other uh, powerfully. Uh, but I also want to just say in these announcements, as we prepare and we pray in our hearts over this next week to uh, be ready for uh, our uh, rejoining in-person worship again, I want to remind you that everyone who comes inside our facility is required to wear a mask. And uh, you'll also be received by some volunteers that will help you uh, to be seated in the sanctuary. And I would just ask ahead of time that we have the spirit of patience and of gentleness uh, to just go with the flow of whatever is asked uh, so that our experience of worship in this first time uh, will be as smooth as possible. If you're curious about other details about how worship might shift a little bit to accommodate everyone who comes, we have an update on all of those protocols on our church website. Again, the URL is listed at the bottom of your screen. And so today, friends, it is the Sunday after Pentecost. It is Communion Sunday. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about what it is uh, to re-enter our way of life and, uh, and what it is to receive the new foundations that God may be laying for our church and for our personal lives of faith. The message today is entitled, What We Must Not Forget. And so I pray that your heart is with my heart today as we continue to center our hearts to worship our living Lord.
So this morning, I ask you, as we begin to eagerly anticipate looking forward to coming back together in worship, that we pray earnestly and diligently this week for, for our country, for our brothers and sisters around the world. And I ask you that, that as you're at home, if you've got family there with you, grab their hands. Hold on to them. Will you pray with me as we pray together? Let us pray. Gracious and loving Father, this day, this, this day that you have given us, help us to be full of your Spirit. Help us to reach out to those that, that need to hear our voice, to know that, that in Christian love we are reaching out. That we seek to heal relationships to heal the sick. Help us, O oh God, as a country that we might come together in your love. May we as University United Methodist Church be a light upon a hill that you have set us on that we might, might reach those that need to hear us and need to know your love. Lord God, you tell us in your word that, that they will know us by our love. Help us to hold that deeply within us. Help us to look inside ourselves and seek you in all that we do. Lord God, we pray all of this in your son's most precious and holy name. As we pray together, our family prayer that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, this also brings us to our time in that, that we would greet one another. And over these past weeks and months, we have been reaching out and greeting each other with, with a hashtag. And, and I, I want to remind you what that hashtag is. And that hashtag is UUMCLCLive. So I encourage you to, to take a picture of your worship space or take a picture this week of how you're, you're living out the embodiment of being a, a believer in Christ, being the hands and feet. What is it that we're doing and greeting one another? You can also, if you're, if you're a first time guest with us today, I encourage you to, to reach out to us and, and text GUEST to 337-409-5883. And know that we want to love and connect with you. Will you connect with us and join? Amen. If there's one thing I know about the people of University United Methodist Church, it is that we are a generous people. Not only in our spirit, not only in the ways that we live our lives with generosity, with uh, the things we pay attention to and the way that we uh, live love through our hands and feet, uh, but also in the way that we give of our financial resources. Many of you have been so faithful to continue to sustain our ministries in a way that, that you promised. And uh, I just would encourage you as we hit these summer months and sometimes as we go camping and we go on vacation, or even as we stay home at a distance, it, it sometimes kind of uh, maybe slips off. And I would just ask you if there ever is a time where you would stay firm, stay steadfast, and stay faithful in your giving, it is today. And so there are many ways that you can give. You can, of course, send in a personal check through the, through the mail uh, addressed to the church, and we would gladly receive that. And you also have many online options, whether it be setting up your automatic uh, checking through our give uh, portion of our website, or a one-time or sustaining gift uh, that is taken from, uh, from a debit card. Whatever, whatever it is, those ways are available to you so that can, you 
you can live your faith and continue to show your love of God uh, through holding up the ministries of our church that truly do touch community around us in a powerful way. And so I invite you, uh, even now, uh, go on our website as it's listed at the bottom of your screen, or even have that uh, that sacramental kind of um, action of writing that check there on your couch today and, uh, and sending that off in your mailbox. Uh, we thank you for the ways in advance you will, uh, will meet that need and meet that challenge. May God bless in this moment both the gift and the giver. Amen. Enviado soy de Dios, humano list I stop, para construir con él un mundo fraternal. Enviado soy de Dios, humano list I stop, para construir con él. Justice and of peace, the task is ours to do to set it really free. Oh, help us to obey and carry out your will. Sent out in Jesus' name, our hands are ready now to make the earth a place in which the kingdom comes. Sent out in Jesus' name, our hands are ready now to make the earth a place in which the kingdom comes. The angels cannot change a world of hurt and pain into a world of of justice and of peace. The task is ours to do, to set it really free. Oh, help us to obey and carry out your will. The task is ours to do, to set it really free. Oh, help us to and carry out your will. For joy and strong, he breaks my side and cast all wish for all. Oh, uh-huh. 
So today's scripture comes from the book of Ezra. The book of Ezra, chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. Today, I'll be reading from the message. And I want you to hear the words and hear the connectivity. How do we, as Christian brothers and sisters, connect to this scripture? If you've, got the, the, if you've got your app out, you can read along with me. Or if, you, if you've got your Bible, I encourage you to pull it out, open it up, fill the pages, and read along as we continue to read Scripture today. Will you follow along? In the second year after their arrival at the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, Zerubbabel, son of Shiltiel, and Jeshua, son of Josadak, made a beginning together with the rest of their people, the priests and the Levites and all who had come to Jerusalem from captivity. They appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to have the oversight of the work on the house of the Lord. And Jeshua, with his sons and his kin, and Cadmiel and his sons, Benui and Hodaviah, along with the sons of Hinnadad, the Levites, their sons and kin together took charge of the workers in the house of God. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments were stationed to praise the Lord with trumpets, and the Levites, the son of Aspah, with cymbals, according to the directions of King David of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And his steadfast love endures forever towards Israel. And all the people responded with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of families, old people who had seen the first house on its foundations, wept with a loud voice when they saw this house. Though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted so loudly that the sound was heard far away. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So it has been almost three months since we were last together face to face in worship. I know the last time I was with you preaching was March 1st. It's hard to believe. And as I stand in this empty building today with only a few uh, gathered together to be uh, the body of Christ to receive the consecration of communion today, uh, I find myself uh, asking uh, the question, what have we learned? What have we learned? You know, many of us over the years have experienced church in one way that it is a place that we gather for worship for one hour on Sunday morning, or maybe two, uh, if you're lucky. And, uh, and if we are not ones that gather in a building, what is the church for? It's really a question of uh, ecclesiology, what we believe that God meant the church to be even at its beginning. Reverend Tom Dolph uh, read for us the story of Pentecost and then helped enliven our understanding of what the Holy Spirit did in that moment when the church's foundation was laid once again and we were reminded that it really can be just that simple, uh, that the people that believe and call in the name of Jesus can gather in all sorts of different ways and that lives can be transformed and changed. Even in that day of Pentecost, over 3,000, uh, most likely more, were saved. And it calls to us the question, what in this new chapter as we regather and maybe some of our old habits are taken on but new ones begin to form, what will we still as the church in the 21st century be known for? Is it having a beautiful building? Or might it be some ways where if we and our ministries stop today, if we and our witness in this community fell away, or even our witness online now fell away, what would the people around us who encounter us miss? What would be the void that 
is created. I hope as we begin to prepare to gather again, I, I wonder if, as each of you and as I reflect, what are those things that we saw persist in the midst of a time where our facility had a sign of closed on it? What ways did our ministry continue to remain open that impacted your life and my life? Was it the connections that persisted? Was it the care of the sick that continued to happen on a daily basis? Was it the feeding of the needy through some of our collection of food or the ways that I saw each of you as brothers and sisters in Christ meet a need when we knew it happened just in this organic and very natural way that it was initiated from your hearts to another? We have to continue asking and maybe truly answer for the first time these questions as we move forward. What are we for? What are we about? You know, it has been, whether it is the, uh, the constituted church that was created in the name of Jesus Christ over 2,000 years ago, or if it was the people of Israel, the people of God that continued to sojourn in exile outside of their normal trappings of how they found themselves to be able to most fully praise their God, this question has persisted of what are we for again and again and again. The scripture Reverend Chris read for us uh, today is from the book of Ezra, one that is often overlooked when we're teaching confirmation class or when we're flipping through the Bible, just trying to find some points of inspiration in times of struggle and trouble. But I find that this text is one that is filled with truth, filled with a little bit of drama, and filled ultimately with hope. The latter verses say, and they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for God is good, for God's steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised God, because the foundation of the Lord was laid, but some wept bitterly. You could see the tension and the struggle that was found in the midst of all sorts of different divisions in the people of God. It seems most obvious that there are some generational shifts, but no doubt there were probably some other dividing lines that defined the community as they found themselves as Joshua continued to lead them. The prophet Haggai talks about uh, this, this insight into why the people might have been crying in the face of what seems like good news. Finally, a foundation of a new temple to be laid. Finally, their uh, ways of worshiping, those old ways, would be restored and refreshed into something new. Some for generations and for uh, boys and girls and young men and young women that never experienced the old ways. And they had a chance to be able to break open those traditions for a new day and for a new people. In Haggai 2, 3, God is posing a series of questions. Who is left among you? who saw this house in its former glory. How do you see it now? Is it not as anything in your eyes? It seems like some of the generations of the people Israel, the people of God, those that were sojourning through uh, the wilderness for years upon years, found themselves seeing visions in their mind of Solomon's temple and its grandeur and its glory, and found themselves bitterly disappointed uh, at the temple being rebuilt. 
The foundation alone, the size of it, told them that it would not be rebuilt to its former size, its former specifications. And uh, being the people of God that followed those rules to a T and found themselves steeped in traditions and found themselves finding great comfort in those ways, having it not rise to the level of the original was a perplexing and difficult thing indeed. It would be that the smaller stones were used that didn't compare with the larger ones and maybe their witness perhaps would be smaller too. The weeping clashed with the shouts of joy of those for whom the laying of the foundation was uh, not a disappointment, but a great achievement. In fact, a first achievement of a deferred dream in their lives. So the great detail here is not really about the foundation itself, but about the complexity of the human heart in these times of anxiety and transition and change. And no doubt we can all find ourselves somewhere in that place. You know, the celebrations that were given, you could hear in the words of Scripture, these celebrations talking about uh, the, the beauty and the steadfast love of God that endures forever. It is the same call through the trumpet that was given in celebration in the words of the Psalms and in the stories of the prophet Jeremiah and in the, uh, the beginning of the history found in Chronicles. God's love was being manifested not just in their return to the land, but to the reestablishment of temple worship. The hope that we find in this story is no doubt their worship was different. It was not exactly as it was before, and in some ways they had to learn new practices to find uh, ways to give God praise and to teach uh, the traditions of law that continued to be life breath uh, and abundance for them. And yet still in that relearning, in that adaptation, in that innovation, if you will, keeping the spirit of the law uh, in, uh, in the center of uh, their, their community and sure, they still found their way. We experienced times of great joy and great sorrow in the community of faith and in our community, in our nation, even all the time. In fact, these days we find that the heaviness and the weight of all that we hold and see in the news and media every day perhaps might feel almost too much to bear. Whether it be all of the racial divides and, and protests that have happened for good reason uh, over these past days, or if it's some other weight or doubt or struggle that we hold collectively and emotionally as the congregation uh, or uh, personally in our worship in an, or in our seasons of prayer, this is indeed a heavy time where we have much to, sit, to consider and difficult decisions for our own integrity and witness to make. Despite all of these differences in their perspectives and in their responses, the people that were found in the book of Ezra, the ones that uh, were accepting the laying of that foundation and pivoting as they could, even in their differences, the young and old found themselves working side by side to accomplish the same goals, establishing their land and rebuilding the house of God together. And what I hear from this text, if you read it in context with the rest of the story, is that this was not a, a, a working side by side, holding all things in common that, uh, for lack of a better word, candy coated or whitewashed the struggles because they continued to be many. 
but they decided instead to work through them rather than around them. Just as, let's say, with any of our conflicts that we would experience in life or in the church or in the debates that we find in our nation today, we find ourselves, I hope, uh, going face to face with our neighbors that might have a different perspective or a different uh, ethnicity or race uh, in their body, that we would uh, continue to draw closer to each other rather than pulling farther away, asking how we can hear each other better, understand each other more deeply, and also continue to draw close uh, to work on the same side of the table toward a common purpose. It was this spirit that I believe the people of Israel took on even when it was seemingly impossible. And believers like us in any season of life can surely relate to the difficulty of that. There is a mix for us in this season of those that have seen this time of shelter in place as a disappointment, and perhaps might even in the re-entry of our worship as it will feel very different, might see it as a disappointment as well. And others who uh, may have seen these three months, the church uh, respond in a new way and reach to new people might see it too as a great achievement just as others thousands of years ago did. We each respond from our own place in which we stand and the experiences that we have or have not had, the ones that we hold most dear. And the hope that I hold for the world and for you and for me today is in this Pentecost season as the people of God from exile to the promised land found their way, in fact, so will we. It may take time, but we have everything that we need as a faith community to do just that, and even more to be a model of belief and hope and love and faith for others that may feel like they have no anchor and no mooring right now in such a time of rage and struggle, anxiety and fear. Our community around us needs the witness of the church in the peace that it gives, but also the challenge that it reminds us of more than ever before. And so that's what I believe this season of Pentecost calls from us. It is the holy fire that burns within us to remind us that the worst thing is not the last thing and that our hope uh, is invited to be persistent even today with whatever we see and struggle with. The people of Acts in uh, those early days of the church, they too, you can see in the latter part of chapter two, they too held all things in common, but it wasn't without struggle, without a mix of emotions and a diversity of opinion. God was calling them as God is calling us even today to rebuild our community, to set and lay our foundation afresh and anew with a renewed boldness. As we heard from Reverend Tom Dolph last week, as the church, we will be here. No matter what comes, we will be here. And so my prayer for us in the midst of this time as we prepare to see each other again and as we prepare to come into this place so really the work uh, can be done to exit this place and continue to love our neighbors and to live Christ through our hands and feet. Besides singing praise to God as part of our spiritual act of worship, I pray that even in this moment, our hearts and our very lives are being built as a foundation again to be offered as living sacrifices to whatever God may call us to, that we would embrace whatever will be in the future to come. May we hold all things in common when faced with a choice 
between serving our own interests and serving the interest of others. May we hold all things in common when the community needs us most, even when that witness may be hard or require much of us. May we hold all things common, even when the nation is divided and we have to, because of our gospel call, say a hard word. And may we hold all things in common when we are called and have the opportunity to live as sacrifices for Jesus' sake, trusting that that refining fire within us will make us truly better than we have been. As we trust God to lay the foundation in the heart of our church and in every human heart that is called the men and women and the children of University United Methodist Church. May we receive that foundation. May we live that foundation. And at the end of the day, may we give God a shout of joy and praise for all that is to come. May we not forget that it is the strength of our God and the power of the Holy Spirit working within us that will give us all that we need, no matter what comes. In Jesus' name, amen. It is a holy and beautiful thing to be able to finally come and, and consecrate these elements that we have been fasting from over these weeks. And I hope that in some way you've paid attention, even as we have celebrated with love feasts and other ways to connect and be reminded of God's gift in our lives of love and of sacrifice. I don't know about you, I have deeply missed uh, the means of grace that is communion, that is the Lord's Supper. In somewhat of an emotional way, it has risen within me a new appreciation for this time of worship that we share. And so as we prepare to go to God, I invite you to be in a spirit of prayer as we lift up the words of the great thanksgiving. We remember the story, friends, that Jesus gathered at table. Again, he was the one that built a longer table for all to come rather than a taller fence. And so he uh, gathered everyone close and said, this bread and this cup today, friends, is not uh, any ordinary meal, but it is extraordinary. It is my body, which is broken and given for you. Do this as often as you can in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to God, gave it to all of his disciples and said, drink from this all of you, this is the cup of my new covenant poured out for you, for many, for all, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you can in remembrance of me. And so we ask that God today would pour out God's Holy Spirit on each of us gathered here as a representative body of our church and on these gifts of bread and of unfermented wine. God, make them be for us the body of Christ so that we may be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. In all of this, we thank you, God, for what you have done. And we pray in the name of Jesus the Christ, your Son and our Savior, and the people of God said, Amen. 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 As we end our worship service today, we want to remind you after the benediction that Reverend Chris and I will be in the parking lot outside of University United Methodist Church, uh, 3501 Patrick Street. And if you're in Lake Charles, we'd love to invite you to receive communion along with us. Everybody in your car will have an opportunity to receive or to be blessed, and we will pray over you for whatever concerns you have. We hope to see you there.
So as we prepare to regather next week, remember what the church is for, that we are connecting people to Christ, that we care for all, and that we have an opportunity to truly change the world around us. May it be so today and always. Amen.